Good morning and welcome at the Diplomatic Academy. Uh, I welcome you together with the Czech Embassy this morning. Uh, and please allow me, Excellencies and ladies and gentlemen, uh, to welcome especially the Czech Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Jan Libavsky. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lipovsky uh, has been minister for almost two years now in the Czech Republic, but he has uh, a, a life also uh, as a businessman, as someone who works in the private sector. He worked in the private sector, but the last few years he concentrated on security issues. Uh, and uh, in, the, in the Czech parliament for a few years, uh, and he works for the Pirate Party, uh, I guess you were one of the co-founders of the Pirates Party, not really, too young, too young for that. So uh, he's a member of the Pirates Party, uh, and uh, uh, it is certainly an interesting fact that a member of the Pirates Party uh, is, is now Minister of Foreign Affairs and concentrates on security issues uh, in the Czech Republic. Uh, uh, Minister Lipovsky is uh, very outspoken uh, when he comments international affairs uh, and he uh, sided strongly with the Ukrainian, he still sides strongly with the Ukrainian case uh, in the given situation uh, and uh, also in public supported uh, his president against criticism from the, from the Russian side uh, and he found strong words about his colleague Lavrov uh, in, in, in also in, in public media. Uh, so, uh, this is a real pleasure to have him with us for the first time at the Diplomatic Academy. Uh, and the uh, decision was taken that maybe the most fundamental thing that uh, during his tenure so far as a minister happened is that, that uh, he is the initiator and coordinate, the political coordinator of a new uh, Czech security strategy. And uh, he will let you know a little bit uh, why and what the security strategy is all about and, and, uh, and also why the foreign ministry is taking uh, the, uh, the helm uh, on this occasion. Uh, so the, the talk uh, this morning will be geopolitical challenges and the new Czech security strategy, and the minister uh, will also be ready to for a Q&A session. So a short introduction by the minister and then a Q&A session about uh, the Czech security strategy and possibly also about what Austria may learn from our neighbors. It's sometimes we, we should learn them. I remember when Václav Havel gave a speech at University of Vienna, 1993, yeah. famous speech here, and he's, he started the speech by saying that uh, actually we have been living together for 1,000 years, but we have been living side by side. We didn't live, live together. Uh, his hope was in 1993 that this is something we can be changed in the, in the time after the Cold War, after the separation of Europe. Uh, I know you and people like you are working on this, not living side by side, but it is difficult uh, to, to, to really cooperate. Uh, uh, and that's why I think the example that the Czechs already have a new security strategy and Austria is struggling, struggling to create a text for a new Austrian security strategy is a good example why neighbors should more often talk to each other. But this just for a, a, a moment of introduction, uh, I give the floor to Minister Libavsky. So, esteemed uh, Ambassador Briggs, ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, thank you very much uh, for this op opportunity uh, to uh, speak with you, to, to be in front of you, and thank you, thank you very much for warm welcome. And uh, you know, uh, Václav Havel's speech here at the Academy definitely had an impact, since it was on only a few years after the speech when Jiří Grusha became a director of Academy. Uh, I have to say uh, that uh, it's a great uh, theme of discussion, uh, this uh, security strategy. Uh, you, you can have the printed version of the document uh, for you to uh, bring it home, to study it. And um, I would like to maybe in the very beginning 
say a few words on maybe, let's say, technical part of the document, and then maybe a few words on the content itself, um, and then we can have those Q&As. Uh, and why I will be speaking about the technical part of that is the, exactly the reason that I know that uh, there's an ongoing process here in, in Austria uh, drafting a new security strategy or the updated version of the current one, which is the actual case of that. Uh, this document is an updated version of uh, the previous strategies. Uh, you never uh, do it uh, all uh, as, as a new one. Uh, to understand, uh, this document is approved by government itself. It's not going to parliament, but we uh, made sure that the political scene was aware what the drafting uh, is about. It was drafted uh, behind closed doors. And um, one of the main idea, which uh, I am uh, very happy that uh, we were able to keep it that way, is that it serves also as a tool of strategic communication of Czech government towards broad population. So it is approved by government that those key messages of the security strategy of the Czech Republic, where the first sentence is, Czechia is not secure, and the next following sentence is, the main source of the threat is the much deteriorated international situation. It's officially approved, and I think every citizen can understand that we have something to be concerned about. The purpose is not to scare, but to be clear, security-wise situation is like that, and it continues. And then, of course, in many chapters, you then will find a lot of, lot of details uh, about how the security in different areas uh, should be solved. So, uh, this was some kind of ambition uh, which we were able to achieve, and uh, I'm quite happy for that. And to have a, such a nice printed version is, a, you know, like the cherry, uh, cherry on that on that heavy workload, which uh, was done by the uh, by the government. To the content itself, uh, we perceived uh, current situation uh, quite uh, quite seriously. Uh, Central Europe. Czechia, uh, with our historical experience of, uh, of, of European competition, it's uh, quite clear that uh, Russian imperialistic ambition endangers uh, our independence and our sovereignty. And I think it was a clever decision of our uh, predecessors that we became the member of the EU, that we became a member of NATO, and that uh, we can build our um, security, uh, security umbrella uh, through those institutions. This is maybe not what we share exactly with Austria, but I think we do care about what happens in Central European uh, space. And then, uh, beside this traditional geopolitics, uh, there is a lot of global phenomena, which basically, uh, which basically uh, will threaten you everywhere on the planet. Speaking of cybersecurity, uh, uh, security of supply chains, and uh, basically the whole economy, energy security, which we are basically living through right now in these days. Uh, um, production of microchips, it's, it's a very good example, and uh, also uh, climate change. All those threats are somehow described that. Uh, in that in that security strategy, and uh, it's a clear tasking for the rest of the uh, of the government, uh, the institutions, ministers, for different some kind of sub strategies, defense strategy, industry strategy, energy security strategy. You name it. I'm sure that you have also a lot of strategies and uh, action plans. But this is basically the roof which needs to cover cover all of, all of, all of that. So, uh, main messages uh, or the main purpose of the document was to involve the whole society into process, even private companies. If you do are uh, doing a business uh, like um, selling uh, people to mobile signal, or uh, you, you are dependent on some components, and f uh, suddenly someone realizes that the Chinese components are not okay, it has a profound impact on your business. So at least uh, the government is 
quite clear in which areas and how uh, this may uh, this may be a, be a problem. So um, MFA uh, played a coordinating role in the whole process. This is how we do it in, in, in the Czech system, but it was approved by government uh, without very uh, very active and tight cooperation between the state bodies. It would not be possible uh, to do it uh, such, uh, in a such efficient ways. Uh, even some other documents like the de new defense strategy, which is also out, uh, was uh, done basically in a parallel process. Uh, so uh, very good, uh, very good, uh, very good uh, cooperation. Um, there is a uh, few clear statements on Russia. I think we also were quite uh, speaking about plain words about risks which are connected uh, to the rise of China. Uh, we do not describe China as a, as a threat, but many things which uh, are done by China would fall into the categories which are uh, designed as, uh, as, a, as a threat. So I have to say um, that this was, uh, this was done uh, through the fact uh, that uh, we have a good agreement on foreign affairs uh, in our government. Um, I think this is a unique situation actually in, in, in Czechia when president and, and prime minister and the head of chambers and of course the ministry of, of foreign affairs speak let, uh, let's say with one voice um, and um, we were able to explain it in the parliament that this is this is a good uh, good good approach so i think i have covered um, basics very basics of the security strategy i don't want to spend time reading from that here um, uh, I, I, I would leave that uh, for, for, your, uh, for your study time and maybe let's dive into uh, some let's questions. Let's dive into a, in, into a common discussion. Thank you, Minister, for the introduction. Minister, it's, it's, I know uh, Czechia is different from Austria, but uh, your first sentence of this strategy, which says, Czechia is not secure, could, not, could never be the first sentence of an Austrian security strategy. We would always write, Austria is secure, as a first sentence. What's the difference? It's a matter of perception. And, uh, you know, I was waiting when we were drafting the document. I was waiting when somebody will come and cross it out. It, it, had, it had never happened. And uh, it's a funny because uh, there is a almost political meme uh, in a positive way in, in, in Czech politics that in some statistics uh, it was analyzed that Czechia is the eighth or ninth or seventh most secure country in the world. I don't know which statistics, I don't know why they came to that kind of conclusions, you know, those lists. But this um, uh, is very often repeated in Czech politics. Of course, we are a safe country. Austria is also a safe country. Uh, but when you take those security lenses, uh, then you start seeing risks and threats, and it means that you have to do some measures to counter it. So if there is a Russian imperialistic war in the East with Russian propaganda saying that, you know, listing which all cities will be bombed and uh, which territory will be again under the Russian influence. And if you actually spend 40 years under Russian influence or Moscow influence or Soviet influence, it, it doesn't matter how you call it, then we should be quite clear and, and, and plain in stating that, so we are not secure. If you have a superpower um, which is uh, clearly doing steps to weaken rule-based international order, I'm speaking about China, to be uh, to be clear, uh, then we need uh, to take appropriate steps. 
you know, you know the European mantra on, on, on competitor and rival and, and partner. So uh, that means that in our security agenda we need to be aware what does it mean um, uh, to, to have a proper cyber security, what does it mean to work on the security of supply chains. Uh, since uh, it is, uh, it is, it, it, it's, it is a very simple statement. If some military escalation will happen in the Pacific, you know, uh, if, if for example, uh, uh, Beijing would try to take over control over Taiwan, uh, it would influence half of all maritime, maritime trade and uh, seventy percent production of microchips. And it would have catastrophic uh, consequences for the global economy, ergo for European economy, ergo for the Czech economy. And I'm sure that for Austria also. Uh, so um, it's, it's, quite, uh, it's, 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 quite, um, it's quite easy then uh, to look at the Middle East. Now, uh, you know, the strategy was agreed before. Uh, the, the 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 Hamas attack on Israel and all those all all, all that escalation. Now we have uh, Yemen uh, um, Yemen uh, fighters. You know uh, those um, uh, uh, sending rockets to, to Israel. Uh, possible escalation. Uh, we have uh, we have Iran with its influence in region. Um, it's, there's a lot of potential. There's a lot of potential for things to happen, as well as uh, in, in Western Balkans, when uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of uh, Latin sleeping uh, hatred, um, and we have to do everything to prevent it. To prevent it, you need to be clear with yourself what is possible to happen. Yeah, it's, it's in the tradition of Czech realism, I think, that this paper has been written, which uh, I appreciate very much in an insecure situation. Uh, so uh, there is a, it looks like a competition for a renewal of security strategies in Europe. And I guess this is a consequence of the Russian, war, Russian aggression in Ukraine, mostly. Uh, the Germans, the Czechs, Austria is discussing it, others are uh, updating it. So is it really a Zeitenwende that we have to respond to by producing, uh, as you write, a whole of government, a whole of, 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 of society uh, document? Um, strategy is a tool, and we have to perceive it as a tool. It's not an intellectual exercise. It's not a, It's not... A, it's not something abstract. It's not something uh, which could be understood as a philosophical piece of working for itself. It's, it's a tool which helps to align different policies in a wide security uh, system which every country has. It's a clear guidance for our embassy embassies, it's a clear guidance for secret services, it's a clear guidance for, for Ministry of Defense and Military, it's a clear guidance for uh, Ministry of Interior to understand how government agreed that uh, risks are assessed. So this is what we have to understand. So um, uh, it's, it's, it's a nice image of competition. Uh, I th I, I, we would do that anyway because our security strategy was from was basically uh, 10 years old at the time. I think it was 2013 or 2015 or something like that. So it, uh, so it, needed, it needed to update anyway. Uh, the change, if there would not be the Russian invasion to Ukraine, uh, to Ukraine um, would probably uh, be less ambitious, uh, but uh, it, would, it, would happen, it would happen anyway. Uh, Austria is in a similar situation. Our security strategy is also about 10 years old. But in the Austrian case, it has, will have to pass parliament, uh, as a parla uh, as a, uh, uh, possibly in this, still in this, in this uh, legislat legislature. We'll see. Uh, you, as I said, you are very outspoken. And before I open here, let me ask you, um, you mentioned Russia and China in very clear and unambiguous words in this strategy. 
Uh, do you feel this, this is the best strategy to approach uh, a problem like Russia and a possible problem like China? Uh, I guess you say yes now, because otherwise you wouldn't have put it in the strategy. Yeah, we tend more or less sometimes, many of the Europeans, to avoid the naming and shaming. Uh, but with this paper, I have the feeling now is the time actually to, to name uh, uh, those who uh, work against the rules-based system, who, who challenge uh, uh, our, uh, our multilateral system. Was that also behind uh, this strategy that you want to be outspoken about what's really happening on the ground? Um, you know, um, the point is not to provoke or to make headlines. The point is to have a clear guidance. Um, on Russia, it's much easier in Czech systems, uh, che in Czech systems since uh, people really understand and many, many of uh, current working professionals still remember 1968 when uh, Soviet uh, tanks destroyed our democratization attempts. Um, uh, on China, uh, it's a more delicate work. Uh, of course, it's a public document, so everyone can read it. Uh, and uh, we uh, are uh, willing and, and we do uh, confront uh, confront uh, even even China on that. Uh, let's say when the votes on different kind of resolution in in UN happens, then you have the small work how those resolutions are voted. Then you vote on that. So so this is the place where the competition happens. It's not some kind of. Um, I wouldn't see. This is the where uh, where this where this really happens, and so it may also happen on the on the platform of the EU, for example, or in NATO, uh, when we do the uh, assessment of of risks in different uh, areas. My, my last question is really: um, How can you fit this into? The, the other structures that we have, European Union, in your case, the NATO structures, uh, how well does this fit in? I'll give you one example. Uh, the, the, the positioning of, of EU member countries in the, in the Israeli war against uh, the terrorist group Hamas. Oh. Uh, um, you know how, the, how, how difficult it was uh, in Brussels uh, to find a common text among EU member countries? You've been also involved on the level of the foreign ministers. You know that uh, the resolution uh, went berserk in, 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 in New York uh, as far as the, the positioning of EU member countries is. What's your feeling about this? How can a strategy help in such a case? Okay, very good, very good question because it's, it's specific, it's a concrete. And um, I can provide you with a typical dilemma uh, which uh, every minister of foreign affairs or prime minister have. So one of the cornerstone of the strategy says that the EU and NATO are key to provide security to Czechia. Both institutions are basically equal into that. The EU has brought security to European, or the European project as such, brought the security to European continent in an unprecedented way. Uh, now, through the different kind of political decisions, we see the EU mostly as a, as a matter of prosperity. <laughs> we maybe should be more speaking about the security, um, uh, security arrangements which brought into, into the Europe. And NATO, because it's a military organization, because it gives us the, the, the security guarantees from the Germany and the US and all the cooperation, et cetera. So those are equal cornerstones. And when situation like this happens, and there is a discussion of European Council or Ministers of Foreign Affairs and FAC, uh, Foreign Affairs Council, uh, you have some very specific national interests. In the case of uh, Czechia, it is uh, our historical and, and, and friendly bond towards Israel. Uh, and then you have European unity. So this is the dilemma. To push ahead very specific national interest, which is demonstrated by some kind of statement regarding things, or to protect the European unity, 
which is creating you the foundation stated here in the security strategy. And of course the document very often, uh, uh, not the document itself, but the strategy, the, 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 the having the strategy uh, provides you very often with answers that you need to do some compromises for the sake, for example, of the European unity, because this is a higher, higher value. Uh, so to, to have a clear vision of what you want to achieve in which ways and how in foreign policy is absolutely necessary. Frankly, who decided on Israel voting against the resolution? Did, was it you, or was it you based on the strategy, or was it the government? It was me deciding in that moment uh, through the whole context when the Canadian amendment uh, that the Hamas uh, will be denounced for the ter uh, as, as a terrorist organi organization uh, did not pass. Thank you. I open the floor for questions. I'm sure there are many. Let's start. Let's start here. We get a NATO question, Mr. Failing. <laughs> Thanks a lot for this opportunity, Director, because it's uh, one of the few areas in Austria where I can speak and openly say yes to NATO, and that will be also <laughs> my campaign. You can say it everywhere. <laughs> Because in Austria, I'm running a campaign, a public petition. I have collected 6,000 signatures for Austria to follow Sweden and Finland in NATO. And sadly enough, you know, despite my efforts always to come with my NATO flag everywhere, <laughs> my question maybe if we can make a picture afterwards together with NATO flags, because in Austria, that's impossible to do that with politicians. But in Czech Republic, as a NATO member, maybe that's quite possible. Do you, do you recognize the building on the cover? Yes, I love yes. it. It's, it's a NATO and headquarters, actually. <laughs> And I want to learn something about diplomacy, and I would like to understand, uh, because I went to all the neighboring countries of Austria in the last year of my campaign, and I made press conferences and statements with my NATO flag on my YouTube channel, and I may always when a Czech politician is coming, or a Slovak politician, in Austria, a press conference, I tweet a lot, you know, say something about, say something about NATO, because we are in the European Union, you know, we decide about, about everything together. We really do a lot of common decisions in European Parliament, but on the one question which really matters for our security about NATO, the Czech <coughs> president comes here, the prime minister comes here, you come here and say, you know, NATO membership for Austria, that's your decision. Uh -huh. That's the one thing nobody really wants to say something. Is it pure consideration of Austrian politics because on this is somehow diplomatic politeness, or is it because you really don't care? Or, if I may say so, is it not in the Czech and in the Slovak and in the Hungarian and in the Slovenian interest that also Austria, which is somehow a neutral bloc in the between, is also joining our alliance, which is about the security of Europe? And if you can help us a little bit here with this debate, and if you're outspoken, that would be perfect, because there's not a single Austrian parliamentarian who is able to say one sentence that NATO is normal in Europe there's not a single one. I was at a special se session. There was one last week during our national day. And, you know, there was completely out unbelievable statements. You know, one thing, the government line in Austria is that the highest public good in Austria, the highest, above freedom, above democracy, above human rights, the highest public good in Austria is the government line, is neutrality. This is the status of our debate on security. We are lost without you. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Minister. Y you are very well aware that you are putting me into a very peculiar position. <laughs> you know, it was Warsaw Pact, which would happily include new members, even without they maybe mm, their will, you know. Uh, but NATO is not working this way. Um, so uh, it is internal matter of Austria, it is. Uh, and of course, NATO is having open door policy. And there's uh, quite a lot of states uh, with vision to join uh, NATO. Um, and NATO was able to expand. And uh, definitely NATO was able to expand uh, when countries uh, which share the similar view of the world affairs and have same values and uh, are ready technically to join, um, so then it happens. So it, in the case of Finland, it was lit almost overnight. It took some time. In the case of Sweden, um, we have a political discussion with Hungary and uh, Turkey about uh, their parliaments 
to uh, to approve uh, the treaties. And of course, if uh, and uh, uh, if and when um, there would be Austrian request, you know, that someone from Austria would <laughs> knock at the at the door in in NATO headquarters and said, "Please, um, can we join?" Because we have agreed so. Uh, definitely, then uh, it is possible then that the serious discussion would begin, uh, and it's definitely not wrong of the Minister of Foreign Affairs of one of the NATO countries um, uh, to be uh, to be part of such a such a debate. Uh, it doesn't mean that I don't have my personal opinion on that. Uh, but definitely not today is 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 the place to uh, to, to share it. So um, that's uh, that's the reality of respect towards the Austrian democracy. On the nuclear power. Uh, the, crit the Austrian criticism about nuclear yes. power plants in yes. in, in Temelin. Yeah. 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 So the Czech minister is 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 simply m more polite than Austrians when they criticize Tembelin. Uh, where next? Yes, please. Yeah, thank you very much for your uh, speech. Uh, you are uh, a Czech is part of the Visegrad group. My question is: Is there uh, what is the future? of those four countries cooperating. And um, well, uh, you mentioned Victor, uh, Hungary and Viktor Orban, and now you have another uh, neighbor uh, uh, which, uh, whose government changed, if you can say a few words on that. Yes. Um, yesterday, uh, new Slovak Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Blanar, uh, visited Prague. We had a bilateral, we spoke a lot. Uh, and one of his key messages uh, was uh, the vision and will to bring a new life uh, to E4. Uh, I am not against to have discussion, uh, against the idea to have discussions on the on level of V4, but um, currently to have a, some kind of profound debates, uh, I'm looking forward new Polish government. Uh, maybe you have read the newspaper that the President Duda said or did, I don't know uh, what is the actual state, if his uh, just idea or if he really signed the paper that um, he will nominate again Morawiecki to try to, to have a government. He did it or? He did it, okay, so he did it. So I don't know what are the exact legal procedures in, in, in Poland, but I think it's clear that that government uh, has no chance to get the um, uh, the confidence if uh, the three parties having majority will be able to stick together. So probably uh, there will be the cascade of, of new governments. So let's see, let's see how how that will how that will go. Uh, so uh, this is the practical side of that. Let's have a V4 prime ministers, ministers of foreign affairs. We need to understand what how the cards are dealt in um, in Central Europe. Uh, the, because the Czechia has the presidency of V4 uh, of this year, uh, till the, it's from summer to summer, so in the summer started our presidency. Uh, the label is V4 citizens. Uh, we have been able to identify three topics uh, for our V4 cooperation, um, which are people-to-people -people connection, infrastructure connection, you know, and Ukraine, because we want to discuss all important things. And... Um, Let's see. Uh, let's see how that uh, how that how that will goes. Uh, I hear uh, from um, if I'm able to read, maybe not even between lines, uh, from our Slovakian friends uh, that um, Fico was quite clear that he wants to somehow start negotiating about uh, support for Ukraine. Um, and uh, also uh, for some funding for Slovakia uh, um, in, in connection with that. 
so uh, maybe v4 may become a tool for that maybe not uh, let's see let's see how this how this initiative will go for me it's very important uh, that we are now preparing the visit of prime minister Fico to prague i think it uh, will uh, be a um, very important political moment to see uh, what is what is agreed there you didn't mention Hungary in the context of V4. <laughs> Would you like to share some thoughts about it? Um, so, um, during my tenure, we uh, tenure, uh, tenure, tenure, we we met uh, multiple times on V4, but uh, we were not able to find a strong common position which would be stronger than what was agreed on the EU level. So uh, basically, the purpose uh, V4 as a tool was not materialized. Um, I don't think that it will change. Uh, I think uh, it will be more a uh, platform to exchange our views uh, rather than to be able to find a common position. So V4 on a on this sort of level is not functioning, if I understand you correctly, but you worded it more carefully. I would not, I would not say those words, uh, because what does it mean not functioning? V3 actually was uh, founded by the Hungarian President Antal, by uh, Czechoslovakian President Havel, and by Polish President Lech Walesa. It's a one declaration, that's all. There is maybe some international treaty because we have this V4 fund, but uh, everything in V4 is done based on a goodwill, on a tradition, and we are meeting. We, we are meeting, we are discussing, because we are, as a Slavkov, it's a similar, so, so we are uh, meeting with Alexander and uh, with our Slovak counterparts. Uh, we, do, uh, we do a lot of discussions, a lot of events, and we exchange information. And uh, this is very important in Central Europe, or C5. Uh, so V4 is working. Maybe it's not working in a sense which was put it into that few years ago, but it's a 30 year, it's a 30 years of Central European cooperation. So I would not say that the V4 is not fun uh, functioning. So you're optimistic. As a minister, you have to be optimistic. Um, yes, please. So at first, uh, thank you very much for quite exciting uh, lecture. And my question is, uh, what is the meaning for a uh, Czech security strategy, the, uh, the enlargement of European Union uh, to Ukraine as well as to the Western Balkans, especially, uh, especially uh, in the era of uh, threatening Russian imperialism? Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm, I'm not aware if and how the enlargement itself is addressed in the, uh, in the strategy. Uh, because uh, this, is, this is not directly connected to the security affairs as such. It's more uh, the part on the importance of the EU and NATO and creating the secure environment uh, in, in Europe. And definitely uh, I do and our, our foreign policy believes uh, that uh, the enlargement is very important uh, activity to secure Europe for Ukraine. The, the EU membership and NATO membership is the key security guarantee which they are basically fighting for. Uh, we don't know how uh, the war uh, will exactly end. I hope uh, we, 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 we have to stick to the principles of territorial integrity and sovereignty of Ukraine. And uh, we have to stick to the principle that Ukrainians need to have a word and agree with any peace solution so that peace is long, long-standing and it's a just and um, uh, so it's a just peace um, uh, in, in Europe. Because what is the other option? 
and I would like to elaborate a little bit on that. Uh, so um, I will make uh, one uh, historical parallel. In 1938 in Munich, uh, four powers agreed that Czechoslovakia um, will be stripped by uh, Sudetenland and uh, the other territories, and that those will be given to, uh, at that time, Nazi Germany. Uh, what was the result? It didn't prevent the war, because it, uh, the Nazi empire snowballed, got new resources, and uh, the six-year Second World War started. And Czechoslovaks felt betrayed. And this feeling of betrayal took decades and and now you know we are over that it is a different story but it didn't create the, the, the atmosphere of security and, and it didn't postpone anything and I really warn to do similar thing to Ukraine to dictate them that they would be stripped uh, by Crimea by the eastern territories you know give it to Putin so there is a so things calm down. Immediately, 40 millions of Ukrainians will be upset on Europe, on us, because we betrayed them, and Russia would not stop. So this is the most dangerous scenario which is ahead of us. Uh, I am regularly warning against that. So in this regard, speaking about enlargement means that we are ready to take them, to accept them, even to guarantee something for them in a, in a time and they are ready and, and you know they are fighting they, they are really fighting for that the situation is not easy but our inactivity and neglect, uh, neglect, uh, neglecting them might have much more worse consequences <laughs> because to have upset 40 million Ukrainians feel betrayed would not bring anything good and I'm not saying that they would attack us or something like that no, it would not happen but it would create a very complicated situation. There would be constant political crisis in Ukraine because they would be fighting each other why things got wrong and why part of the territories are not again in Ukraine. Of course, there is a different kind of ways and visions how things will end, uh, but the Kiev needs to have a word and we need to stick to our principles and not to repeat uh, mistakes. I guess you discussed this also with your new Slovak uh, a colleague, <laughs> because the, the support of, of Hungary and Slovakia is, in this case is very important. Yeah. Um, definitely, uh, we are able always to find some kind of agreement on the sanction packages and on the European conclusions. So this is uh, the most important what I what I follow. Hello, I have a very short question. Um, I saw that uh, within the new secu security strategy, the uh, defense industry has also a, a role to play as part of a strategic industry and as part of the strategic interests. And my question is, uh, will there be a security uh, industry strategy also be developed? Oh, uh, this is a very specific question. and. Uh, Honestly, I don't know the right answer since this is the world of Ministry of Defense. Um, there is a very active cooperation between our Ministry of Defense and the, um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the military industry in Czechia. I don't know if they have the strategy designed for that as such, but definitely in a, security str uh, in, in a defense strategy, and uh, in all planning, the military industrial base plays a very important role and the ability of state to cooperate with it, to develop with it, to even have some capacities prepared for some uh, escalation scenario, uh, scenarios um, is part of that. So uh, we think about that uh, very closely. Uh, the real answer could be provided by the people from MOD. But it basically, the answer would be ye yes. I don't know if there's a specific document as such. Another question over here. Good morning, my 
nearly 40 years in the British diplomatic service, we said that NATO was the cornerstone of our security and the, the European Union was the cornerstone of our prosperity. Increasingly, we also said that the EU was uh, playing an important role in security. Do you consider that the UK's departure from the uh, European Union has diminished our uh, common uh, security? And one supplementary question. I noticed in this document that you say that the OSCE should resume its role. Do you consider that that, in present circumstances, is a realistic possibility? So Brexit and OEC. So NATO to Austria and UK to EU. I'm making notes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I do get it. Um, um, paradoxically, in the terms of cooperation now between Czechia and, and uh, Great Britain, um, the cooperation is founded on security matters. So in the bilateral relations, uh, this is now the most important, not the only, but the most important agenda we, we have. And uh, same goes um, for, for the EU and, and, and UK, um, because uh, it's not the common EU agenda. It, it makes sense in this, in this regard. Um, and uh, I have to praise uh, UK for what it's doing, uh, especially in... in, in in support uh, towards Ukraine. Uh, so we do share common interest. Uh, we cooperate in this way. Um, Brexit was decided. Uh, Brexit was done. Um, I, I leave it for everyone to assess it. I am um, not the UK citizen, so I am not able to, uh, to think about that, uh, that way. Um, of course, um, um, the European project, um, and, and I absolutely agree with those sentences, NATO, security, EU, prosperity. And that's what I say uh, when I meet people in Czech pub and we discuss politics, you know, during a campaign. I speak in very simple sentences over the beer. So, NATO, security, EU, prosperity, prove me wrong. And I usually win, you know, if, if there is a debate. So, so exactly, so, so, it's, so, it's, so, so it's easy. Uh, and uh, in NATO, uh, UK is, is doing also a terrific job. So uh, I would not say that uh, it necessarily led to less security, because what we still have in common is the security. Therefore, both sides uh, are tend to be working on that. And uh, in sp uh, speaking about OEC, uh, so, uh, the Skopje uh, ministerial is uh, closing by. <coughs> it's a developing story. Uh, and uh, I hope that solution to save uh, OEC uh, working will be found. Uh, I am not in a position to speak about that more publicly because most of that is happening behind the closed door, but OEC has a, if I'm right, 57 members, 56, 57, 57, 57 members, and uh, to approve a budget for next year and to found a way how to have general secretary and the other key uh, uh, personas in place, we need agreement of 57 countries. I wish that OEC would uh, be kept alive. I think it's an important institution. Uh, maybe not, uh, maybe we are not now in a position that uh, the importance uh, would, be br uh, would be brought back to life, uh, but at least uh, the ambition to keep it alive uh, uh, is, is right. Um, I think we need OEC, I think we need agreed principles in OEC 
to have in place. And it was late 70s, 70s, uh, when Helsinki, Helsinki Accords was agreed. Uh, it was Soviet leadership which was ready to accept that. Uh, it led to creation of Chart 77 back at, time, back, back at the time in Czechoslovakia, which was very simple thing, you know, intellectuals in, 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 in Czechoslovakia saw Helsinki Act and asked Gustav Husák, you know, that Czechoslovakian president and, and Czechoslovakia communist leadership, please, you have signed the document, so, you know, now <laughs> do, your, do your action in regard to that. Of course, the communist regime was ignoring that uh, at that time. But at least this very basic confrontation could, could happen. And it has a it, it had a positive view, uh, a positive influence uh, in a sense of norms uh, on on European security. And uh, I think we still need those principles. Um, so we should do all possible effort to save OEC. Can I follow up with a more fundamental question on European security architecture? Uh, will the future of this European security architecture be with Russia or against Russia? That's one of the easy questions. Sorry. That's the question is how you define, what do you mean by European security? Uh, if you look in a conceptual way on a territory of Europe, you put a map on a table, then Russia is in. It's part of it. It's part of it. If, you, this, if, you, if you say that the European security is the security of the member countries of the, of the EU and maybe some, some NATO countries and, and friend con friendly countries, then Russia until something really change, is the revisionistic, imperialistic power trying to expand. So then it's not part of the security, and we need to, and, and this is basically what we, you will read in the document, and uh, this is basically, because we have one very specific document, which is called, called uh, revision of the um, uh, relationship between the Czech Republic and Russian Federation. There's a four page, there, there are four pages agreed also by government, um, uh, which describes some principles for our state, how do we conduct. <coughs> and uh, one of the axioms is that Russia will pose challenge and security threat uh, to European continents for decades, at least, if something profoundly not changed. Uh, it may change. Um, uh, it's up to what will happen in Russian Federation, if that will change or not. Um, I do not expect uh, liberal revolution to happen. Uh, I do expect that the current regime will somehow continue. Uh, so uh, we, have to, we have to be ready for that. And it may be cold confrontation, it may be very pragmatic confrontation, but now we are in a very hot phase. Let's go over here, please. Um, thank you, I have a follow-up question on the enlargement question from the, uh, from the front because you mentioned that um, enlargement isn't part of a security strategy. I would maybe disagree with that because I think like if we were to advocate for enlargement and basically m move the EU border further out to places like Moldova or Kosovo, we practically secure ourselves or push uh, the boundaries of risk further. So I would say that EU enlargement is key and essential uh, to having a secure region uh, around us. So it, it shouldn't be shouldn't be part of the security strategy that we should be, advocate for it. It would be a mistake mm. to think about the EU enlargement in a way that it's not me who is facing the problems, but my neighbor. But in the EU, 
my neighbor and I is interchangeable since it is basically one uh, one uh, one area. So uh, the reason is different. The reason is that my neighbor wants a uh, member of the EU or NATO is more stable. It's able to challenge the threat and we can do it together. So we are powerful together. And uh, I think this is uh, where Czechia and Austria really f are able to find a common position, for example, on enlargement in, in Western Balkans. So um, this, is, this is the real reason, not to territorially move ahead, uh, ahead some problems. Let's continue over here. Thank you very much. Uh, do you think in the eye of these two big complex, complex, uh, conflicts going on in the world right now, Ukraine and Israel, that there is a big possibility that uh, Europe will maybe neglect the Western Bank Balkans as an area that is a lot closer to it and that could potentially bring a lot of problems to the Europe and the European Union? Thank you. I don't think that it will happen. Uh, in a way you asked me, uh, I think the much complicated will be to uh, have a, such a policies which will help those countries to really prepare for enlargement. Because there's a big debate on enlargement. There is no single country ready to join the EU. And I think the debate would be much different if there would be countries ready, you know, everything having by the book and just waiting for political uh, approval. This is not the situation. Each country which want to enter the EU has some issues to change. Um, some, you know, in the case of uh, Macedonia, there is a, a necessity, for example, to change the constitution as it, as it was agreed. And you can go country by country. Um, so um, this is the reality. And then you have some countries. Uh, which are raising the issue of qualified majority voting, saying that uh, we need to change the union first, the union first bef before we enlarge. So um, I don't think that uh, the neglectance as such uh, uh, will happen, but we should be aware of saying such a things like that in 2030 the EU will enlarge. I think it was uh, a huge mistake to promise something which you have no uh, means and tools to really deliver. So let's see, let's see, we, and we have to be working on that. It was during the Czech presidency to the Council of the of the EU uh, when we were able to, you know, a lot of things in the Western Balkans actually happened. So it was Croatia joining the EU and uh, the the eurozone, Schengen because they worked on that. I, I was proud that it happened during our presidency. We granted uh, candidacy status to Bosnia and Herzegovina, which I think it was uh, thanks to our presidency because we relentlessly pushed, pushed that ahead. Uh, Kosovo was promised visa liberalization because Kosovo is the only country in Europe completely surrounded by Europe where you have to apply for visas in the, the most traditional way, like uh, typically in, in the countries outside of Europe. It will come 1st of January. I don't know what is the calendar for that, uh, because of the Kosovo-Serbia escalation, the EU did some measures. I don't know if uh, that uh, didn't fall under those measures, so I'm not fully briefed on that. Uh, but you know, this is a country with a lot of young people. And uh, we, are, we are having a country of one million uh, holding those young people kept in Kosovo without possibility to travel. Um, I think we should be, we should be more open-minded about those people and about uh, understanding their own vision for life. I can take a last question. Yes, please. Give me the mic. Ah. Yes, uh, Minister, thank you very much for your uh, very enlightening insights. Uh, my name is Ron Willis. I'm president of the Club of Commercial Councillors here in Austria. Um, a lot of what you've said has helped me lead in 
to my point and also a few other points that others made here. Um, I often get involved in discussions concerning Ukraine and I often use your analogy of the Munich Agreement of 1938. Uh, it would appear now that an awful lot of Europeans who didn't see the light before have now seen that words were not going to stop Vladimir Putin. It was only force. In that line, I would ask if this turmoil in American politics threatens the supply of American military hardware to Ukraine, is there any chance of Europe filling that gap? And if you say yes, I'd like to know why and how, or otherwise, what is the European Union, and more specifically, what is Czechia doing to help uh, handle this problem? Thank you. I don't think that military deliveries to Ukraine are replaceable from European sources. Uh, but we should do everything that uh, European countries in uh, total uh, have the ability to do our own fair share uh, in Ukraine. Uh, the domestic political debate in the US is very sensitive. It's very polarized. Uh, I hope that US will not fall into trap of isolating itself from the world, as we can see this, as a, in this, uh, this, this ideas of, of being isolated ap appears from time to time last 100 years, it's nothing new in the US uh, domestic politics. Uh, I hope that uh, the US leadership will understand US global role and behave by that. And uh, there's a lot of people watching how West will conduct in Ukraine. And if we show signs of weakness, we will be made paid for it. Because they are the waiting for our weakness. So uh, on the level of the EU, uh, we can do a lot of projects to have better production, better technologies, common investments. Uh, so I think there is a lot of things which could be done uh, positively. Uh, many of them, I'm sure, even without breaching uh, the Austrian uh, neutrality. Uh, so, uh, so this is this is what we should focus on, rather than to be just thinking about how to replace the uh, role of the U.S. in, in Ukraine. Well, I guess we have to, to, f to finish here. Maybe I c get something concrete out of you. Did you already take a decision on whether Ukraine uh, should be accepted to start negotiations of EU membership? Oh, this will be done uh, on, uh, I, guess, uh, I guess that this is up to prime ministers to decide uh, politically uh, in December. Uh, formally, probably this is the this is the GAC General Affairs Council, but politically, politically, this needs to be negotiated and decided by prime ministers. And uh, tomorrow, I think it's tomorrow when uh, Commission will uh, publish the report on progress on enlargement. I think it will be uh, very interesting reading. So let's wait till tomorrow. That was almost a yes, but almost yes. <laughs> Minister, thank you for this very frank and open <laughs> this, this course and meeting we had here. We wish you all the best. I know you have a meeting with our foreign yes. minister. I uh, wish you all the best also for the realization of your security strategy, which also increases our security. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.